Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the United States Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon of September 6, 2021. Today, we are honored to have a special conversation for you about longevity, about philanthropic efforts in support of longevity, about companies and initiatives and emerging technologies that can help get us to the point where 90 could be the new 50 by 2030. Quite an ambitious goal, quite a worthwhile goal. So how are we going to get there? Joining us today is an illustrious panel of US Transhumanist Party officers and members, including our Director of Applied Innovation, David Shoemaker, our Director of Community Resilience, Alexandria Black, our Director of Visual Art, Art Ramon Garcia, our Director of Longevity Outreach, Ben Balweg. We also have our Northern California liaison, Celeste Castaldo, our Legislative Director, Jason Geringer. We have our member Skip Siddiqui from the Washington DC Transhumanist Party, also a prior guest on our virtual enlightenment salons. And we have Edward Hudgens, one of our members from the Human Achievement Alliance. Our special guest, our guest of honor today is David Goebel, who is one of the foremost philanthropists and entrepreneurs in the longevity field. He is the co-founder and CEO of the Methuselah Foundation. He is the CEO of the Methuselah Fund and one of the first people to publicly advance the idea of longevity escape velocity, even before this term was formulated. So David, it is an honor to have you here today. And for our first question to you, could you please tell us the story of the Methuselah Foundation, how it got started, what some of its original areas of focus were, and how it has evolved since that time. So there were there were two. Oh, first of all, thanks for that very kind introduction and for inviting me. Uh, there were two strands. One was um, a uh, a young lady had uh, uh, leukemia. She was twenty two. She had just graduated summa cum laude from university uh, and uh, my family observed her gradual decline and we saw how everyone was following the rules in the medical system, but that she didn't quite fit the rules that they had in terms of early clinical trials for bone marrow transplants. And as a result, she was denied uh, participation and um, that really kind of broke my heart to see that everyone was following the rules. The rules were sensible in and of themselves, but it resulted in a beautiful young lady with wonderful prospects uh, dying, terrible ways. Um, the, other, the other part is that um, I was looking at the uh, growth of artificial intelligence and robotics and all of those things. And it occurred to me, whether rightly or wrongly, that we were inventing ourselves out of necessity, meaning we would at some point no longer be necessary. We would be surplus as a species. And that didn't seem to me to be a very clever approach to <laughs> our progress. And so I was thinking about, well, what are alternatives? Uh, what's the rate limiter for humans? Well, we have, we apparently have very, very little limit in terms of intellectual capacity. And we also have these things called feelings, which most people want to get rid of, but I think they're crucial in uh, the human experience and the human abilities. So I thought, well, you know, if you die by the time you're 60, 70, 80, well, that's a terrible depletion of a wonderful uh, resource. And you just start to get awake by the time you're 40. 
course, anyone who's 30 wouldn't agree because they don't know yet. And by the time you're 50, you realize 40 wasn't much to speak of either and so on and so forth. So you just play that movie forward and you go, wait a minute, 150 sounds like it'd be pretty good. You'd have a lot of experience by that time and you would understand, or at least you would try to understand the whole point of being alive, which most people struggle with. Why, why be alive? So I thought, let's start a foundation that would give us a chance to discover those things and a chance to uh, maybe cut the Gordian knot of the uh, medical industrial complex where everyone plays by the rules, but the rules inadvertently kill people. So that's why I started the foundation. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it is indeed, I would say quite a profound realization that most people they come to realize that there's so much to life and there are key insights that come with time, come with experience. But if one's health begins to fail uh, as one has gained that experience, then it, it really is a tragic waste yeah. of potential. And obviously we need to reverse uh, that predicament of ill health so one can, I of jump the, in? Yes. can I jump in yes. real quickly? Uh, Please. In, in, the, in our tax, in the US tax system, there's a thing called a depletion allowance, where as you pull oil out of an oil well, you get an extra tax benefit because of the idea that you're, um, you're reducing the value of the well, and so you should be compensated for that. And so during our lives, we're constantly being depleted by people pulling out our wisdom, our experience, our knowledge, but we don't get a depletion allowance. It seems kind of asymmetrical at best. <laughs> so uh, just to, to kind of close the loop on that, uh, uh, while I'm an entrepreneur in uh, 2001, when I uh, uh, you know, incorporated what was then known as the performance prize society, because I decided prizes were the uh, most aerodynamic 50 caliber bullet to get to where we were going with the least, least perturbance and the lowest profile to achieve. Uh, that, that may be an odd uh, uh, metaphor, but uh, yeah. So anyway, I realized I need someone credibly on the bio side who really agreed. And then I started looking on uh, sci.usenet and uh, eventually I uh, ran across uh, email responses that were reasoned, sensible, uh, measured, honest. And uh, that turned out to be Aubrey. So he and I made common cause. And that's when I suggested we name it Methuselah. The reason it's called Methuselah is because at that time it was a, a very edgy kind of thing. It's still edgy, but by, you know, if you're old enough to remember, that was like ridiculous in the early 2000s. Um, so Methuselah being from the Christian Judeo-Islamic ethic, it's all acceptable. How can you argue against it? He lived 969 years. That'd be okay with me. Absolutely. I think it would be okay with everybody on this panel and most of our audience. Of course, the Transhumanist Party as its first core ideal advocates for significant life extension achieved through the progress of science and technology. And we use the phrase significant life extension to bring in as many people as possible. But most of us uh, I would venture to say, want to live indefinitely. So 969 years would be great. 969,000 would be uh, even better uh, for uh, all of the reasons we discussed. And it is interesting how that constituency that sees this as both a feasible and desirable prospect has grown over the past two decades. But when you started, uh, it's correct that it was still seen as a, a very fringe science fiction type of
prospect. And I came across the work of Aubrey de Grey and the Methuselah Foundation in 2004. And prior to that time, I still wanted to defeat death. I had wanted to defeat death ever since I was five. But uh, I thought that this would be the achievement of humankind in future centuries, in the 2700s, perhaps. Uh, but Aubrey's framework, sends the Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence, convinced me that perhaps we have a fighting chance in our lifetimes. And at the same time, I found out about the Methuselah Mouse Prize as a means of catalyzing public awareness and the direction of funds toward this effort. So uh, could you tell us a bit more about the genesis of the Methuselah Mouse Prize and how it turned out? Um, yeah, there's an author named Deva Sobel. She wrote a book called Longitude. The book was about the discovery of how to find longitude at sea, which was considered to be uh, self-evidently impossible. But because the British fleet kept running aground on the Irish coast, um, they decided let's put out a prize. Now, how did they know about prizes? Well, prizes were a very important part of the English culture at the time. Uh, the queen would give what were known as letters of mark, M-A-R-Q-U-E, to privateers. These are pirates who had a license to steal. That is, um, if you, English captains, happen across a gold-laden Spanish galleon, if you take that galleon, then uh, you give half to the crown, we won't hang you as a pirate, and we will laud you to the skies for being a good English citizen. So then the captain would become rich, and the crew would share in the spoils. It was startup city. <laughs> that was their Silicon Valley. So they liked the idea of prizes because it helped them very much to overcome the um, deficit they had in funding for a Navy. They used the prize idea once they got a, you know, a significant Navy as a way to find longitude at sea. So I read that book and I thought, well, this is capital efficient. And Methuselah Foundation has no money. How do we get from nothing to something? And the answer was, well, we'll build, we'll bootstrap a prize operation where the money doesn't go anywhere until it's won. And it's a very low administrative cost. I mean, what do you, what do you have to pay for while you're waiting for someone to win it? Very little. So, um, that's why I called it the Performance Prize Society. You got to perform to get the prize. And then when Aubrey came on board, uh, he talked about using mice as the model, uh, which I loved because at that time they were talking about flies and yeast and you know that, that was not going to make it in the public uh, eye. Uh, so we, we uh, resolved on mice and I, said we need to name it something that will be uh, defensible to all religions of the world and also would uh, shout out to Heinlein, Robert Heinlein, the science fiction writer, Methuselah and his children. So that's how it came to be called Methuselah Mouse Prize. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that history. And uh, as I recall, there were two winners of the Methuselah Mouse Prize, one for uh, mouse longevity and the other for rejuvenation. So uh, Dr. Andre Bartke won the prize for longevity. He had a special strain of genetically engineered dwarf mice that lived to almost five years. And then Steven Spindler won the rejuvenation prize and he was able to uh, essentially turn geriatric mice into middle-aged mice, so to speak. And what have you seen in the field since that time? Because these were remarkable achievements. Are you aware of scientists capitalizing on them and uh, pushing them 
further out uh, to enable uh, even more robust rejuvenation of mice. So just to, to complete the uh, picture, in 2010, we gave an award to Dr. David Sharp, who was the fellow who um, created the multi-center trials for rapamycin, the gold standard. And, and in 2010, we gave him an award, not the scientists who ran the uh, operations. Because if you've ever, uh, I worked for the government for 11 and a half years, and I know how hard it is to stick your neck out in the government. And he stuck his neck out to put the, a few million dollars on the blackjack table in order to test rapamycin to see if it would actually extend lifespan in experimental mice. And in three centers, independent, it worked. And so I think so far, that is the most important result in terms of uh, being consequential to the clinic. Anybody can calorie restrict, you don't need a doctor. But rapamycin uh, once a week or whatever your periodicity is, uh, shows great uh, prospective benefits. Of course, we all have to live our lives to find out if it really works, but it really works in mice. Now, as far as, uh, uh, oh, there was one other prize given and that was for a university in UK. There was one mouse that lived four years when everyone else in that, that colony lives three years. The reason that it lived for four years was because the handler loved it. Always change the uh, litter on the bottom of the cage, played with it at least once a week, more like once every day, um, talked to it, petted it. And we gave a prize for that because not everything is chemistry and mechanics. We're very complex creatures. And joy, uh, one of our strategies at Methuselah Foundation is restore lust for life, joie de vivre. Without that, who wants to live a long time? And so I think that that's a very important strategy that we are trying to um, highlight. So we gave an award, a Methuselah Mouse Prize Award to that um, experiment as well. It was an inadvert inadvertent experiment. They were shocked, but it worked. So as far as uh, mouse prizes, uh, the purpose of the Methuselah Mouse Prize was to make it possible for scientists to deliberately and publicly carry out research to extend healthy lifespans, because that was not possible when we started. If you were a, a, an undergraduate, not a PhD, but you were on a PhD track, if you, if you said to your PI, oh, I want to see how, how to make people live longer and healthier, and you wanted to be a biogerontologist, you would not get any funding, and you would not have a successful career. Our purpose for the prize was to change it so that in polite company, you could say things that then sounded outlandish and impossibly stupid, and today are just, well, of course. So yes. the prize did its job, but we didn't publicize at that time what the job was. The job was to turn the, uh, you know, the watch stem to a different position so that, uh, and our model was uh, the Los Angeles Grand Prix. Uh, if you get to know me, you'll know that I think almost always in metaphors. Um, the Los Angeles Grand Prix, they, they mark out a route through Los Angeles where if you don't go 200 miles an hour, you're nobody. Do that any other day of the year and what will happen? Slammerville. <laughs> So we, we created a prize where everybody was excited at the idea. Now, um, uh, Edward held up the book, uh, Ending Aging. Uh, early on, Gary Hudson, who uh, is a noted rocket scientist, he actually is a rocket scientist, and 
was one of the very earliest supporters of the foundation financially. He gave us a, a nice donation at the time. I think it was uh, like around $40,000, which was the biggest donation we'd ever gotten. And I looked over at Aubrey and said, now you can write your book. I don't want to write a book. Aubrey, you write a book, then you get in the papers, and then you get on TV, and then you get famous. And by being famous, people will listen. And I'm glad you have a long beard. Otherwise, nobody will pay attention to you. So he said, do you really think so? Yes, I really think so. And to his credit, he and Michael Ray did the job, wrote the book, and he went on TV. So that's that story. Well, thank you for sharing that story. And definitely the Methuselah Mouse Prize captured a lot of people's attention during the early and mid 2000s. And thereafter, it catalyzed the growth of the longevity field and definitely added to the respectability of discussing it in public. I remember uh, the contrast between me bringing up this idea in 2004 versus bringing it up in 2017, 2018, when most people in everyday settings, uh, coworkers or uh, people whom one met incidentally at social gatherings didn't see it as too far-fetched. They may have had different opinions about it, but even among, let's say, lay persons with some sort of opinion, I would say about 50% were mildly re receptive, some were enthusiastically receptive to this idea, some were skeptical, but they were bringing up more of the uh, social impact types of arguments. They weren't saying, this is so ridiculous, we shouldn't even discuss this. So there has definitely been a change in this regard. Now, during the last decade, the 2010s, the Methuselah Foundation has made a series of investments into companies that are focused on specific aspects of uh, disease and specific approaches toward treating and curing diseases. So could you speak about some of these enterprises and what you consider to be some of the most important work there? Okay. So um, by the time 2007 came along, I was sick to death of begging. To be a philanthropic foundation, you need to find people who are, who are willing to give their money away. Well, that's stupid to do. <laughs> so it has to, it's a, got a really high hurdle to get mere mortals to make donations. And I'm forever grateful to the earliest, and even today, the uh, donors that are making uh, donations. But honestly, it was much harder to get the small donations then than it is to get some of the very impressive donations that are being made today. Ha having said that, um, uh, by the time I got sick to death of begging, I thought, well, what's the legitimate way of generating multiplicative uh, returns? So as an entrepreneur, the answer is you start companies that generate value and then you sell them. You sell them to the public or you do a merger and acquisition and so forth. So uh, we started looking around. We had enough money to invest in uh, a company and we ended up investing on the basis of our strategies. Our strategies are different, but um, in the Venn diagram have a high overlap with the SENS strategies. Our strategies are, are more um, uh, pedestrian, understandable by anybody. Uh, new parts for people. Get the crud out. Restore the rivers. As I mentioned before, lust for life. Uh, rebuild the walls. Anybody can understand those things, but they seem so silly and yet they're very instructive because it tells you what doesn't qualify to fit in that strategy. So in this case, we had a, 
a number of companies or entrepreneurs who wanted to start, start something. One of them was um, uh, Gabor Forgach uh, and his son had started a company along with Keith Murphy. The company's name was Organovo, the world's first 3D printer for human tissues. And I thought that really fits with our new parts for people strategy. Anyway, long story short, we made the first outside investment in that company in 2009 uh, in March, which was the absolute trough of the global financial collapse. But that's when we made the investment because we're not in it for the money. We're in it for return on mission. Does it move our mission forward? If we get the money back, that's great. Then we recycle it in an ascending spiral, we hope. Well, that all came true because in 2012, they went public. In 2013, we got a 43X return. And I thought, wow, let's do this some more. So um, Gary Hudson and friends, uh, Matt Schultz, came to me and said, we have this idea of getting rid of senescent cells on the strength of the Mayo Clinic results. And uh, we have this wonderful idea of a, basically a fire and forget delivery technology that will allow senescent cells to self ablate and no other cells to be affected. And I thought, aha, this is a platform, a delivery platform, kind of like a printing press. You can do lots of things with it. So that's part of our, our ethic here. We look for platforms. So anyway, that's how Ocean started. And they are able to selectively ablate senescent cells. And then in honor of our donor who had started uh, with us at the beginning, uh, who ended up with prostate cancer, and uh, unfortunately he passed away. In his honor, we actually started a project to use the, the platform to get rid of uh, senescent and cancerous cells, in this case, prostate cells cancer cells and it and it worked so that was spun out into oncosenics so there's two companies one was a spin out as a result of it being a platform then uh, we had another strategy which is debug the code all of these were in advance in advance decided in advance of uh, starting a company we were approached by three Stanford uh, uh, two professors and one undergrad who would be came a PhD subsequently. Uh, this is turn bio. Uh, this is epigenetic reprogramming that takes a cell back to its youth, but keeps its phenotype. Uh, you may have seen some news about a new uh, organization arising called Altos, invested in by Bezos and other folks. Uh, our investment, our founding investment in turn um, was on the, the basis of them already having achieved that, oh, five years ago. And so there's been five years worth of progress since that time. If you read the MIT Tech Review article, uh, their approach is science and discovery, but we're headed to the clinic. And our goal is to uh, make 90 the new 50 by 2030. So those were a couple of investments uh, another one was Lucadia Therapeutics. This one is perhaps the only one that's single disease focused, and that's Alzheimer's. Uh, I believe in economics as a science, even though it's more art than science. If you had a, a situation where if something is not cured, it will bring bankrupt every medical system on the globe, wouldn't it be good if you had a half a percent chance of solving it, if it was only gonna cost you a hundred grand? Well, that was the calculus I used when I listened to Doug Ethel's presentation at, um, at a science conference. He said, I got sick and tired of following the A-beta Tao Tangles uh, parade I became convinced that after $25 billion in 25 years or whatever the numbers are, that we were wrong about something very, very fundamental. So I went back to look at anatomy. 
gross anatomy and asked what, what are the things that are common about people who begin to get mild cognitive impairment and that leads to Alzheimer's. And the answer is anosmia, meaning your sense of smells goes bad. Well, where does the sense of smell originate? Oh, the olfactory bulb, where do they live? On top of a structure called the cribriform plate. So he looked at the cribriform plate and realized that nobody had really done any studies on the cribriform plate since Gray's anatomy or something like that. And so um, I, I decided that this was worth a half a percent uh, risk. That if he was right, oh, what was he right about? Um, there are uh, invaginations and uh, perforations, channels inside the cribriform plate that serve as a cerebral spinal fluid reservoir and transfer point into the lymphatic system. So glymphatic to lymphatic, meaning it fit our get the crud out strategy. The metabolites weren't getting out of the brain. So lots of it, you know, there's a nice channel that goes back in your spinal cord. But what about your prefrontal lobes and all of that stuff? That drains through the cribriform plate. Starting in 2013, um, I think that's when we, he, no, 2014 is when he made his hypothesis. He published his hypothesis. Then I think we invested, uh, I, <laughs> after he gave his presentation, I took him in the back and said, hey, you want to start a company? I'm like, what? Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so that's Lucadia. We did, uh, uh, we funded uh, ferret studies where their cribriform plates were occluded 50% and they began getting Alzheimer's like symptoms and brain atrophy. If you look at where does Alzheimer's begin, uh, at the etiology of Alzheimer's begins just above the cribriform plate and then goes like fire from there. So still isn't proved, but it's a good bet. And the bet's getting better and better. So one day I hope that we can say that for a few hundred thousand investment on a ridiculous uh, risk, um, we ended up curing Alzheimer's or at least preventing it. What were we talking about? <laughs> well, I think you quite helpfully answered my previous question, which was to give an overview of some of the enterprises that the Methuselah Foundation has invested in. Now, you mentioned uh, as part of that discussion, the difficulty in attracting smaller donations, especially at the onset of a charitable foundation's existence, as contrasted with attracting larger donations later on. And we've seen this in other contexts in the longevity field recently, the SENS Research Foundation has received some large donations. Uh, for instance, uh, Vitalik Buterin of Ethereum fame, the Pineapple Fund, uh, Michael Grave, and then recently Richard Hart uh, facilitated this pulse chain airdrop uh, endeavor, which led to $28 million being raised. And these are impressive sums by uh, early to mid 2000s standards. I remember uh, myself, I, I tried to raise some money for the Methuselah Foundation. I ended up raising uh, close to $300, but the way I did it was essentially uh, asking people to give very, very small amounts of money, a dollar, five dollars, I would be very vigilant and pick up spare change that people would drop on the streets and I would gather it and donate it to the Methuselah Foundation. Uh, but the scale of that was uh, a lot smaller, uh, many orders of magnitude smaller than these huge donations that occurred later on. So why would you say it's easier to attract these large donors, at least as a, at a certain stage of an organization's maturity? And what sorts of challenges does the organization have to overcome in order to reach that stage? So 
so there's uh, approximately 20 answers to your excellent question. So I can't, of course, uh, bore the audience with all of them. What I can say is that at the beginning, remember we, you know, it was outlandish to do such a thing as what we were trying to do from 2000 to 2000, I'm gonna say 2010. Really, it took that long to change the opinion. The purpose of the prize was to say there are results already, you can believe this. And as a result of that, Calico came into existence. There are, there are a variety of different sensibilities out there. There's the Anran and Ayn Rand folks who are pure utilitarian and think that if they give money away, they are wrong to do so. That's an opinion, they're welcome to it. So I can't say that's what was going on with Calico, but um, it was a business designed to make money and people had stock in it, that's, that's fine. But I simply want to ask, what have they accomplished with a huge initial funding? Then you look at Unity Bio, which was, um, I think they ended up at their peak at about a half, half billion dollars capitalization. They had millions of dollars and they invested it in, um, knee rejuvenation by ablation of senescent cells in the knee. Now our intuition is that that would not work because the SASP, the inflammatory SASP is a global phenomenon. And how could you, you know, just keep it out of the knee? The body's just gonna take back over. Uh, that was our theory. That was our thinking um, because, uh, and that's why we've been going for global uh, removal of senescent cells, reasonably global. Um, anyway, so what did that money achieve? But they wanted to make a lot of money. Our goal is not to make money. Our goal is to have return on mission and the belief that if we're pragmatic, sensible individuals, that the money will come. I'm constantly reminded that uh, Samuel Pierpoint Langley, the world's foremost aeronautical engineer in 1903, with millions of dollars worth of inflation adjusted funding, built machines on the Potomac River that went off the platform and went straight into the river. Whereas the proverbial mecha bicycle mechanics uh, were the ones who actually did fly. Thank you very much for the picture. <laughs> the, the value of history is to know the backstory. There was um, a problem with the airfoil. The, the Wright brothers discovered that no matter how they use the formula, they could never quite get the right lift. So they thought, I wonder if the formula is wrong. And so they built their own wind tunnel how many people know that the Wright brothers built their own wind tunnel? Probably your audience, many of you do. But they did a lot of original research and nobody thought they were worth the powder to blow them up because after all, they're just a couple of bicycle mechanics. But they did fundamental research that the globally famous aerodynamicists who probably did the formula got it wrong. Reality is a wonderful teacher. You can't argue with it. It is. And so that's our approach. We invested in Turn Bio and the Stanford scientists because they had demonstrated rejuvenation of individual cells while keeping phenotype in living organisms, mice, where there were six functional improvements, functional imp <clears throat> improvements across the board. They said, but the only thing that we don't seem to be able to affect yet is telomere length. And I said to them, I don't care if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. This works as long as you're not lying. So we're gonna bet on this. We're gonna bet on this to debug our code. So, yeah.
what you have to do is to scale your operation to the possible. A prize was possible. And so it didn't need a lot of money. Scientists are wonderful people, generally speaking. Andre Barkey gave the money back. He said, I want you to succeed more than I want this money. So, um, yeah, so we were able to get enough to prove enough to get a little bit more, to prove a little bit more. And what you're doing is coming out of a credibility hole. What creates credibility? Well, hype creates a lot of credibility, but it doesn't last long. But actual achievement, that's credibility. And people could care less about Methuselah Foundation. What they want is the goods. And that's our job, is to deliver the goods, to get a return on mission. So speaking of the return on mission that you are putting forth, the goal of making 90 the new 50 by 2030, it is a more concrete goal. I'm curious how you're framing it. Would it be that there is the potential for one person uh, at that point in time, a uh, chronological 90-year-old to become a biological 50-year-old, or is it an even more ambitious goal in the sense that people could get treatments within the clinic if they're chronologically 90 that would enable them to look and function as if they're biologically 50 and have a comparable remaining life expectancy to today's 50-year-olds? It's a combination of the two, but more the latter. I know personally, some 90 year olds that have all of their marbles, they're sharp as tacks, they're not in wheelchairs, they have their own autonomy. And that's the kind of person I'm talking about. They're not basket cases. Uh, forgive the expression. They are re resolvable, they're, they're recoverable. Uh, they have a full complement of organ capacity in the sense that they, you know, their heart isn't about to blow up. So that's the kind of person I'm talking about. I'm not limiting it to that. I mean, we could do better, but that's the kind of person I'm talking about. Is that helpful? Yes, I think that is helpful. And uh, I think the next logical question is, what do you see as the pathway from uh, here to there, from 2021, uh, where we have some studies that suggest certain avenues for reversing aspects of biological aging. We have some uh, preliminary treatments, some stem cell treatments, some senolytics, uh, a few other approaches, some gene therapies. We've had Liz Parrish who received a combination gene therapy that may have reversed aspects of her biological aging. She certainly looks as if her aging has been reversed, uh, though that's anecdotal, I understand, but uh, she's a pioneer and there are other pioneers as well. Uh, and what do you think would need to happen in order for 90 to be the new 50 nine years from now. And along these lines, Celeste Castaldo also asks, what is available to us now that could be used in 2030 to extend life? And would that reverse aging uh, per se, or would it just prolong uh, a kind of healthy aged period? We started, we, we made the statement making 90 to 50 by 2030 because I, I have an anger at most foundations, um, not to pick on anyone in particular, but how long have cancer foundations been accepting money to cure cancer? 50 plus years, right? What's the deadline? Is there a deadline? So I, I thought to myself, in order to focus our efforts, our resources, we need a deadline. So what would be the right deadline and the right way to put it? To say 100 is beyond the imagination of most people. 110, 120 is like, I don't want to live that long. But 90 is just kind of like right on the edge of, 
okay. People know someone who's 90 and they're spry like, uh, yeah, I think I'm borrowing a, a, a word that was in the, uh, yeah, sharp as a tack, one of the comments from Celeste. Her grandma was, was sharp as a tack, right? 100 year olds, not so many. Anyway, so we have a falsifiable goal. That was the job, falsifiable. So we either make it or we don't. We're gonna be embarrassed if we don't. What if we only make 80 the new 50 by 2030? We will be so embarrassed. <laughs> Not really. Anyway, um, no, I've forgotten the other question. Uh, well, would you say that if 90 is the new 50, that this would involve a component of real biological age oh, reversal? Sure, sure. Um, we've already got the companies that started and uh, Altos and so on. These are all following the same path. They know what we've got. Um, I'm on the board of TURN and I can't say a lot about it, but what I can say is there are a lot of companies that wish they had our IP. Our goal is to make that available to the clinic. Now, one of the ways that we proceed at Methuselah Foundation is look for the holes. What are the holes that aren't yet filled? So we feel that uh, epigenetic reprogramming and senescent cell ablation are two holes that are scientifically in the process of being filled. We did our job. And that others who wish to compete, I like capitalism, uh, I'm not greedy, I want other companies to succeed. It brings more investment in. So having said that, you have a thing called uh, the regulatory state, and that's an extremely important and valuable thing. I am not against the FDA. Some people are, are very much against it. I'm not. However, there is a reality. The reality is that mice are terrible models. About 95% of what works in mice will not work in humans. Now here's the other side of that coin. How many things that would work in humans died in the lab because it didn't work in mice? We have no idea. So um, we started a project called Patient Trials on a chip. If you know about the uh, levels of competency for autonomous driving, uh, Tesla loves to point to, we're going to be a level five company. You'll, you'll get in the car in New York and wake up in the morning after sleeping all the way to Key West. That's level five. Level zero is you're eating your submarine sandwich in the driver's seat and, you know, driving all night with your bleary eyes and coffee. Most companies now are at around level two, level two and a half. But that doesn't matter. The cool thing is the competency levels are easy to understand because they're not how, they are what we want. So when it comes to organ on a chip, liver on a chip, uh, human on a chip. Most, most of the industry focus on, focuses on the technology. We're not going to do that. What we're going to do is to create a competency level, and we're in the process of doing it, uh, of what would level five be for patient trials on a chip? What would level three be? And so forth. And so um, about Two months ago, a prize that we were administering for NASA, Vascular Tissue Challenge, came up with a earth-shatteringly important advance, and that is microvascularity to be able to ramp up what had been 20 cell thick printed human cell constructs to be able now to ramp them up, to scale them up to at least a centimeter and if you can get to a centimeter, you can go bigger. So that's finished. We did it. That hole got filled. 
So NASA was very excited and surprised that it actually got one. And I give a lot of credit to the winners, all the credit really. Um, so what should the next thing be? And, and well, the next logical thing was, well, let's make a whole new organ. And I think that's still maybe a bridge too far. And in the meantime, if we could develop a competency level roadmap, what happens with those is if you get enough buy-in, they become manifest destiny. The companies who are making these chips or in silico programs or combinations thereof will begin to orient themselves to we're a level four company. We're already at level two and investment will be easier to bring in because people don't under, have to understand the how, they just need to understand the what, what are you doing? And how do you fit in with all of these other folks? So we anticipate that our goal is to have that competency level roadmap completed by the end of 2021. We have um, had the advantage of all of the judges and all of the scientists who worked on the vascular tissue challenge one, number one, who have stayed on board and in their great generosity are helping us put together this competency roadmap. The foundation has also put up a half million dollar challenge fund for a prize for whatever level four turns out to be. Now notice the name is patient trials on a chip. The goal here is that regulatory bodies will look at this and say, if anybody is level four, we will take that data as if it was a phase one safety trial. Why is that important? Because without that kind of change, you're still gonna have to do animal models and they don't work and you'll get to humans and phase one is too small usually to catch all of the bad stuff. And by the time you get to phase two, you're into 50 to $100 million and it's just insanely expensive. We need to raise the water for all the boats so that they don't run into the cliffs of insanity over and over and over. <laughs> Excuse me, I have to take this call. It's scam likely. Somebody wants to be famous. Does anybody know who scam likely is? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So uh, Celeste uh, Castaldo asks along these lines, how close do you think we are to human trials on life extension biotechnology, be they trials on a chip uh, which would need to be accepted by the FDA as valid human trials or any other uh, kind of human trial, a more conventional human trial, do you think we'll get there fast enough to uh, make 90 the new 50 by 2030? I do think that. I think that we will begin seeing uh, safety trials by late 2022 and um, then lots of them. I know that's a rough number, but lots of them will be happening in the 2022 through 2024 period. Our goal is to have the patient trials on a chip one given in 2024 or 2025, because if there are new companies that come into existence or that wanna get funding, Methuselah Foundation is very unlikely to invest in them because they won't be able to, to achieve the 2030 timeline. Do you see how that affects our thinking? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean other people won't invest. This, is, this uh, field has become explosively valuable from a story standpoint. Everything is stories. So we have an interesting comment from Edward Hudgens on the concept of free to choose medicine 
as a potential option for reforming the FDA process and allowing a parallel track for proposed treatments that have passed the phase one safety trials and at least one phase two trial, similar to what was done in 1992 with the AIDS parallel track. Uh, this allows for real world data to be reviewed complementing clinical trials, and it could facilitate new ways of testing, for instance, using chips and AI. Uh, do you think this could help with your timeline and realizing it sooner, perhaps? Um, so it's the dance on the edge of a razor. Uh, on the one side, you have nothing useful happening. And on the other side of that razor, you have government and pharma uh, sending an asteroid your way. So my answer is uh, learning how to dance is the most important thing. So <laughs> that's a way of my semi avoiding the question. So I'll say this, um, I am thrilled at the right to try legislation that was passed. I believe that there is a lot of societal pressure behind the dam and that right to try is a crack. There is another thing called patient funded trials, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And those things will gradually gain um, gravitas, energy. And here's another thing that's, that's clear. The government agencies know what's happening. I know that they know what's happening and that the folks want these advancements. They want it to happen but it has to happen in a way where uh, they can sleep at night. I mean, there's, I'm sure, I don't know personally, but I'm sure there are many folks at the FDA who are quite unthrilled at the CDC taking over their role on these uh, uh, vaccines. Two very high, high level FDA scientists just you know, decided to retire because something's wrong. But in, uh, in, in crisis comes air spaces where progress, through which progress can run. And so that's how I'm looking at it. I want to be their, I shouldn't say I, the Methuselah Foundation and its donors want to be their helper. We want to help them uh, because there's, um, when I was in the government, I noticed that for every $1,000, 999 of those dollars was typically spent making sure the $1 that remained was spent correctly, according to the law. So uh, a foundation is actually also a creature of the United States government. And it has tax exempt status and tax deductible status as an encouragement to do things that either the government thinks is a good idea, but doesn't want to, can't do right now, or the government recognizes it may not be the best, most effective actor. There's actually good reasons for such entities to exist. And so when, when it came to the NASA uh, vascular tissue challenge, um, they were prohibited by Congress from paying for the, their partner's expenses. Methuselah Foundation got dime zero from the government for operating the vascular tissue prize. We currently are operating the deep space food challenge. Same rules, we get nothing, except we are able to um, add uh, things like optimal nutrition so, uh, yeah, we're very, very excited about that. The, some of your, your members may be interested in one day being able to survey the surface of the moon and uh, Mars. I, I kind of want to stay where I am. I like it. We just went to a, a, a winery and had some nice wine and beer and chocolate. That was pretty good. It'll be a while before we can do that on Mars, except because of NASA's Deep Space Food Challenge. 
you'll be able to have a processor that will fit in the size of two refrigerators and get there and give them the food and nutrition that they need. Now, our eventual goal is to have a processor that in real time knows your metabolic, metabolic state, what you need, what you'd need less of, and that it informs the processor to give you the food that's best for you. And our goal is to have that to be available on Earth. That's also NASA's goal. Canada is also involved and we're working with other space agencies to get them to come on board as well. So you're not allowed to use the word Olympics because that's a very jealously uh, guarded trademark, uh, but Olympus Mons, you know, it exists. So the Olympus uh, of the unknown, uh, anyway, that doesn't work. I have to figure out a name for that. Maybe, maybe one of you will come up with it. Yes, that's fascinating. And Jason uh, was intrigued about the deep space food challenge as well. Uh, it's interesting to consider that the kinds of food that we will take with us to space and the preservation techniques for that food will vary dramatically from what we're used to here on Earth. Now, Edward, do you want to follow up with regard to your question about regulation and potential ways to incentivize more effective regulation or more uh, timely regulation. I'll just follow up real quickly and I really appreciate what you're saying here um, because part of what I do is I work in the Washington DC area. In fact, I've been to the last three FDA uh, conferences uh, which you've probably been to those as well. I was literally at the FDA headquarters uh, on uh, the last day of February last year, talking about reform and saying, you know, I, some of your regulations are getting in the way of um, getting out uh, processing kits and things like that. And I think this COVID thing could be a real serious problem. So you really need to look at this. And sometimes I hate it when I'm right. But um, yeah, uh, what, well, one of the things I see in DC, and actually this is one of my projects, is we are starting, I worked uh, before all of this, I was working on FDA reform. And now, you're starting to get some interest and now that we're kind of past the election, there's a little bit more bipartisan interest. Okay, so what do we do in the future? And especially because of technology. I mean, in uh, I think it was April, 2019, the FDA put out a call for how to regulate uh, software, AI software as a medical device because it's not a medicine. So I guess it must be a medical device. So I guess we have to regulate it somehow. They're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Again, I know a lot of the FDA people, it's not they're evil or anything like that, even though I'm a good libertarian, it's that they're in a system that is clunky. They've been putting you know, fixes in it since 1962. But I see right now there really is a possibility to have nonpartisan reform saying, folks, you see what the future could bring. I would like to see Aubrey de Grey and you and others doing things on Capitol Hill and with with influencers in Washington, D.C., the way a lot of us did 20 years ago when we were pushing reforms to allow the emergence of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and people like that in the space area. I really see that this is the time to do that because of the science, because of the breakthroughs, and because people are looking at, well, what happens with the next pandemic? So this is music to my ears, all of what you are saying. Okay. So we recently um, helped a uh, 5014C uh, get started, uh, a4li.org. And uh, 5014C, uh, by the way, Methuselah Foundation is utterly nonpartisan, mm -hmm. apolitical. Is that Dylan Livingston's uh, group? Pardon me? Uh, which group is that? It I might have been in touch with them already. Okay, well, anyway, we gave them a startup yeah. grant. Um, they're going to be helping us uh, with, um, you know, socialize, popularize, and uh, other, otherwise PRSIs the patient trials on a chip roadmap. But that also gives them startup funds so that they can t take care of their larger uh, mandate. And uh, so you might be interested in reaching out to them. If I haven't already, again, I just reached out to, is yeah. it, uh, is this Dylan no. Livingston's group? 
It's Dylan Livingston's. I've place. been on the phone with him already, and I want to work with him since he's in New York and I'm here, and this is exactly yeah. exactly what I want to do. So okay, I'll... well, yeah. they've got some funding now. Okay, well, we'll talk off maybe contact offline because I see the possibility of doing what we did in the late 90s and early 2000s, where we would hold events on Capitol Hill. We were educating people. We were raising their consciousness about space. And I want to do exactly the same thing. And I've got some funding to do exactly that. So uh, anyway, this is an exciting cool. time. This is the time to do it. Thanks, Edward. Excellent. So it looks like there are some near-term prospects that are quite exciting in terms of making various kinds of human trials happen, as well as accelerating the advocacy for these technologies to be reviewed and accepted within the regulatory structure. So I'm pleased to hear that. Also, we have in the YouTube chat, uh, one of the investors in the Methuselah Fund, Amund Hove, uh, who says, uh, thank you for all of your efforts, Dave. So uh, I wanted to pass that along. Uh, I further would like to ask a question posed by Daniel Twett, uh, since you mentioned uh, senescent cell remedies. Uh, and he asks, what kinds of knock-on ripple effects do senescent cells cause among surrounding healthier cells? So they, they secrete, first of all, I'm not a scientist and I don't even play one on TV. Having said that, um, they secrete a um, fluid, a, a, a flow that um, induces other cells to be in distress, to be inflamed, and to then take on the same characteristics and become senescent themselves. So I tend to think of it as uh, a graffiti artist in a neighborhood that breaks windows, the broken window idea, and that uh, these zombie cells create other zombie cells in their neighborhood radially on a three-dimensional uh, basis. And that it, if, they don't, if you don't get rid of them, they ruin the neighborhood. So you gotta get rid of them. That's kind of a, a cracker barrel explanation but it actually turns out to be close enough to the truth because at Ocean, where we've done experiments on the mice, just like uh, we did with, uh, as was done at uh, the Mayo Clinic, um, the mice lived, uh, you know, 15, 16, 18% longer than normal in already aged mice. Another thing that was very nice is there was no adaptation to the treatment. You do it every 30, 40 days, and it remains as effective as the first time you get it. Further, if you, if you think about our delivery methodology, we're able to selectively search for any protein expression. So P53 being um, uh, one of the, the key targets, if you find P53 and P16, it's senescent and cancerous or precancerous you can do the, a combo um, smart bomb. And we have, I, you know, it's pr still proprietary research, but I can tell you that those mice live very nicely long lives without cancer. And uh, they look better, uh, feel better. And uh, there you go. Well, thank you very much for that answer. and. Indeed, I think you do a great job in communicating these concepts in layperson friendly terms, both here in this conversation and on the Methuselah Foundation website. So hopefully that helps with the task of uh, facilitating public education on these matters and essentially communicating to people uh, some of the important aspects of these approaches that the Methuselah Foundation is pursuing or funding. Now also, Daniel Twett asks, how feasible would a standardized 
probable lifespan detection test be at this point? And I suppose another way to phrase it would be a test for measuring one's current biological age and from that trying to discern what one's remaining life expectancy from a statistical standpoint would be because uh, if we want to make 90 the new 50 by 2030 it would be very good to have a test that could evaluate chronological 90 year olds to see if they are indeed biologically 50 or a different age that is an excellent question i think though that the answer might not be satisfying but i'll give you my answer my answer is that I don't think we know what aging is. And I don't think that we know whether any of the current uh, measuring devices or methodologies are measuring age. Are they measuring associations? Are they measuring causal mechanisms? What are they measuring? And do we need to measure them? You ask a typical 90 year old, what would they like to see in the mirror? What would they like to feel like in the morning? What would they like to be able to do during the day? Do you think they know? Do you think they remember what it was like to be 50? I do, I think they know. About two years ago, we commissioned a study for our own use, which is now available to anybody who wants it, called Making 90 the New 50 by 2030 looking through the literature, PubMed and such, to discover medically, functionally, what's the difference between a 90-year-old and a 50-year-old? And we got a ton of measurements that are functional and you know, blood test relevant and so forth. Those, I think, are the more important measures. For people who are between the age of 30 and 50, I think those clocks have some utility. Uh, but nobody really knows if they do yet. Looking at the error bars, the last time I looked, which I admit was six months ago, the last time I looked, the error bars were plus or minus seven years. That isn't even hand grenade distance. So what do I think? I think it's wonderful for people to be investing in it, to get it to be better and better and better. But let's say that you have a, a, a clock that says you are biologically 40 and you are chronologically uh, 50. Well, what does that mean? Is it actionable? Or it says I'm chronologically 60 um, and biologically 70. Is it actionable? What do I do with that information? So my, my preference, the focus I have is actionable information. And I have a feeling that we'll get much more actionable information from uh, the various omics. Not so much genomics, but epigenomics, proteinomics, enviromics, which I don't know if that's a word yet, probably is. Where you live, who you're around. I mean, let's say you have a toxic relationship, that's gonna kill you sooner. Um, so anyway, I hope I've, I hope I've uh, conveyed how I think about that. So another way of putting it is, we don't have any investments in clock companies. Clock companies do not make you 90, uh, 50 by the time you're 90 in 2030. So others can invest in that, and that, that's great as far as I'm concerned. Understood. Now, Alexandria Black uh, attended the ARDD uh, conference, the Aging Research and Drug Development Conference, uh, virtually. It was held in Copenhagen a few days ago, and she says she learned from that conference that aging has multiple causes. It goes back to your comment that it's difficult to define what aging is. And this is analogous to how various cancers are really different diseases, even if they occur in the same body part. Now, I'm curious, Alexandria, if you want to elaborate on that, some of the insights 
uh, along these lines that you observed and heard at the conference? Okay, uh, we did learn uh, that uh, there's a substance called SLC 25A1 that is crucial to NAD absorption in cells. And uh, so to, to it, a lot of it went over my head, but I, I did learn that and the bit about uh, that we can equate uh, aging to various kinds of cancer, that, that uh, there's so many uh, factors uh, in there that, yeah, it's a lot to untang. So my question to you, David, along these lines is, do you think over the course of this decade, scientists will converge on any sort of singular answer as to what aging is and be able to say definitively if aging has been reversed in a particular individual. So let's say you have a really healthy 90 year old who can run marathons and feels great and has fewer wrinkles than uh, your typical 90 year old and doesn't have heart problems, doesn't have diabetes, cancer, dementia, et cetera, uh, would scientists as a matter of consensus be able to look at this person and say well uh, this person has had some age reversal happening or would they just say this is a really healthy 90 year old but we don't know what this person's remaining life expectancy is it could be that he or she will just live out the next 10 years in really good health but still die at 100 whereas a sickly 90 year old still had a chance of getting to 100. Well, I don't know how scientists will be thinking in 2030. And I don't know that it matters because what will matter is, will that 90 year old fall off a cliff or not? And that won't be known in 2030. What I can tell you is that 90 year old will be very, very happy with whatever remaining years there are. And that the evidence of such a 90 year old will generate such tsunamis of capital that they'll end up there, she'll end up there anyway. I think of the uh, dictum, the goal that Kennedy said in 1961 or 62, I think he said, and we're gonna to go to the moon this decade. That was laughable, but they did it. Why? Because of the focus, everyone got on board. So every human being is on a gangplank into an abyss of information disintegration. They might not want to be there once they feel comfortable that it could work. Most people, I think, don't wanna think about this because they can't stand the idea of the disappointment that might occur. They'd rather stay busy. And that is why we have business, busyness. And that's an interesting insight that much of human activity seems to really be an intentional distraction from the prospect of one's own decline and non-existence. And yet, of course, humans are capable of tremendous achievement. And if they were to direct that same energy, that same activity yeah. toward reversing uh, that decline, or at least uh, arriving at the insights that would enable humans to do that later on, and it would be time much more productively spent. Now, Aubrey de Grey in recent months has spoken of the prospect of a fairly near-term inflection point in public attitudes. And he mentioned this even in our virtual enlightenment salon with him in February of this year, where essentially he foresees that 
public opinion will come to recognize the prospect of longevity escape velocity and clamor for it before even the science has advanced enough to be able to deliver it. But if people's expectations change away from this resignation to the inevitability of death and toward the idea that we can do something about this problem, then there will be a sea change in priorities overnight and there will be a lot of pressure on policymakers to deliver solutions and we had better have uh, some sort of infrastructure ready by that time to respond to that public pressure. So do you agree with that evaluation that sometime this decade, this inflection point uh, will arrive and we will shift from a society that largely discounts the prospect of indefinite longevity to one that sees it on the horizon and will be motivated to pursue a moonshot type of initiative with massive investments and participation from all sorts of players, public, private, academic, in this endeavor. Um, I'm going to give you a firm I don't know. But what I will say is that uh, uh, there, we, we've already had one massive inflection change in the first decade and the proceeding into the second decade of, of uh, a sea change in the attitude of the scientists and the academic community. And now more and more rapidly, the investment community is putting real money in. So when Jeff Bezos and uh, others put their millions and not yet billions, but significant capital into this area, well, all of the other venture capitalists are also going to have to look. And there's an opportunity to make a ton of money if you're a venture capitalist to raise a new fund focused on this. Now, what's, what's wrong with futurism is the, the linear extrapolation based on the current means and methods. The current means and methods require a half billion dollars and uh, at least a decade, probably 15 years, to get a small molecule drug onto the marketplace. That's a ridiculously expensive prospect. So the reason that we're focusing our resources on changing that dynamic is to change the rules of the game to instead of it being half a billion to make it 50 million to get a drug to market. At half a billion dollars, you're talking about the only company who can afford to make a mainframe computer is IBM on the whole planet. And the only person who can afford to make a 777 is Boeing, period. That's what's called regulatory induced economies of scale. Our goal is to make it much less expensive, much more productive, and much more um, useful by getting away from animal models and using human models. Because after all, you may have noticed, we're you actually human. And so wouldn't it be good to use human models that are fully validated and better predicting than one in 20? One in 20, pathetic. Wouldn't it be better to have something that's 85% of the time, right? I'm not even gonna say 100%, but you know, even 50% be much better. Instead, what we're doing is we're taking oceans of money and pouring it into a wood chipper. Let's not do that anymore. So let's change the dynamics of the game. I don't need, I don't want to have a huge inflection point. I want to make it cheaper to do it and to do it more accurately and more usefully. And honestly, that's, I believe what the FDA wants at the end of the day. So this is quite interesting and quite admirable in my view to seek to lower the barriers to entry uh, to scientific achievement. And 
also to enable innovators to spend less money in conducting trials and getting their experiments through the system. Edward Hudgens points out in our internal chat that a Tufts survey found that typically it takes 10 to 12 years and almost $3 billion to bring a product from the lab to the patient. And of course, only the largest corporations have those kinds of resources. And that means a lot of smaller innovators are constrained in what they can do. Either they can't do anything or they have to team up with a large corporation. And that has its own obstacles, its own internal bureaucracy. Yeah. A lot of promising advances may never see the light of day because of problems with the system, not problems with the concept. So Edward believes we need the FDA to accept innovative ways to test proposed innovative treatments. Where do you think the barriers are right now? Because you said you don't think the FDA is an inherently bad organization. You think uh, a lot of the people at the FDA actually want these advances. And I agree more generally, a, a lot of civil servants are uh, good people. I'm a civil servant myself. And uh, I see well-intentioned uh, actions that sometimes fall short of the intent because the system creates incentives and barriers that make it very difficult for the best intentioned people to achieve their results. So where do you think those issues are with the FDA? Where are the bottlenecks that we can uh, perhaps exert some influence on to overcome? Well, um, the EPA has uh, committees already set up to um, move toward, move away from animal testing. So they are officially in the boat. The EPA, a lot of people forget about the EPA, but the EPA manages all regulation for novel chemistry and a huge amount of novel medicine comes from novel chemistry. And EPA has already declared that they will not allow for animal testing after 2035. And I believe their goal is to have, to reduce animal testing by at least 30% by 2025. So our hope is to help them get there faster by uh, generating public uh, encouragement. How do we get to the moon? The United States population wanted to go to the moon first. So that's how we got to the moon. And so how do we get here? We, we have a roadmap that people can say, yay, verily, that's cool. I think I would like to have level five where we didn't kill and torture rabbits anymore for testing to see if cigarettes hurt their lungs. Like, of course it does. We don't do that anymore. So it would be nice to like take a step back and realize no scientist that you'd ever want to deal with anyway likes killing animals. So to essentially help the uh, public become aware that there's an opportunity to end this and to improve everything else at the same time. I think that's a pretty good selling proposition. And we're just going to take our shot at that proposition and see if we can accelerate instead of it being 2035, make it 2025 by means of a roadmap, strong approval and uh, acclaim by the scientific community, some senior scientific community, <clears throat> uh, publicizing it, and then having a prize challenge. So there's no facts in the future. We will see what happens, but I'm very hopeful it's coming together very nicely. So it's interesting, based on your answer to that question, it seems that you think the dependence on animal trials is more of an obstacle than uh, any sort of institutional 
a set of incentives as such. You think the institutions are actually coming around to trying to find alternatives to animal trials, but it's more the historical paradigm of needing to test something in mice or other animal models first before going to humans that is the major bottleneck in your view. Sure. Yes, yes, I think that's true. I think that uh, there are some very, very brilliant people working at very, very large corporations who will look at this and say, we should be using these models. And they will. And it, it's kind of like the first mover advantage. Well, if I can get a drug through the FDA for 50 million and you're still spending 3 billion or whatever it is, I'm going to win. Because divide 50 into 3 billion, how many shots on goal is that? And especially if your goalie has been pulled. <laughs> if you don't do it, you're dead in five years. Interesting. So once the alternative to animal trials is widely available, uh, you believe there will be an incentive effect throughout the market to adopt yeah. that alternative approach. Yeah. So I'd like to tell you why I think I deserve to have an opinion about this. We were the first investor in Organovo. Organovo was the first company, as far as I know, that did architecturally accurate, high fidelity 3D human tissue models for kidney and liver, um, skin, and now uh, bowel. We were the first investor in Viscient Bio, which is working on biologic, on uh, small molecule uh, drugs uh, aimed at uh, solving liver problems, and a volumetric bio, which makes uh, insanely advanced 3D printing uh, systems that I think are going to shock, shock the world in a good way. All of which can be and will be applied to the discipline of 3D tissue models, patient trials, and a chip there first. I know it works. And there are other companies too, not just ours that are doing this and they're getting good success and pharma is paying attention and so are the small startups they have to pay attention yes and this is indeed quite promising now i want to pose a question from jason geringer because it's a common question that we encounter and i would be interested in your particular response to it or your approach to that question when you encounter it. So Jason writes, one of the things some people worry about is that the treatments for anti-aging will only be available to the rich and create a long-lived elite class. Do you think that is something that could really happen? Or do you think the tech will be available to all? A fair answer is, I don't know what's going to happen. The second answer is, I know what I want to see happen. I want this to be available to anybody. So how, so we, as a species, we call ourselves homo sapien sapien, wise, wise man. We have not earned that. We are not, as a species, very wise. So it's beyond my capacity to see that future. All I can say is I want it to become possible. When humans first flew from 1914 through the uh, early 50s, you had to be wealthy to fly. You also frequently crashed and died. You know, it's a double-edged coin double-sided coin. But then in the 60s, gradually anybody could afford to fly. So, but, it, but in this case, I think that um, it would be very hard to get away with not providing these pervasively, very widely. These technologies as they emerge it would be very hard to get away with it. Part of what we're trying to do is to influence, you know, the butterfly and the Jurassic, or is it Cretaceous? Anyway, 
uh, we're trying to influence things because we're a nonprofit. And so our goal has been to take small equity bites and to encourage our companies to stay lean and mean as long as possible so that they don't lose control as the original entrepreneurs and have a greater impact on the answer to the question that was asked. In other words, awesome. we're doing what we glad to hear you say that. It's it's really good to hear that, you know, you're concerned about that. Want Thank it to you. be available to all. So that's good. But sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, it's it's nice to know who actually asked the question. Um so we're doing what we can is the art of the possible, right? Um so our typical is we'll take 15% at a maximum. We'll take as much as, as little as 5% of a startup company because we want the founders to stay in, to advance the science and to get it to the point where the originators are the ones who make the money. And if they succeed, Hopefully, they will want to do it again with the hundreds of millions that they might make because it's enough. And I can tell you that all of the folks that we have been working with are in it for the mission. The key is, will they stay in it for the mission? So we're, we're hoping to give them those tools. In the meantime, we just want enough funding to stay in the game so we can play the next hand in the card game, metaphorically speaking. Yes, indeed. And that's quite an admirable approach, especially in allowing the founders of these companies to remain in control for as long as possible. And I found it quite perplexing generally in the world of startups that so often the founders, the people who originate the concepts, who make these enterprises possible at some stage get removed from their position by venture capitalists who invested in the company originally because of the vision of those founders. So uh, perhaps in search for short term and often illusory profits, these venture capitalists destroy the uh, metaphorical goose that uh, lays the golden eggs. Uh, and it seems to be a self-defeating dynamic. Along these lines, Alexandria Black asks, are the pioneers in longevity getting muscled out by uh, VCs often? Uh, have you seen that in your experience where there's a, a promising startup and good people behind that startup, but they become too dependent on venture capital and for whatever reason, uh, cynical short-term uh, profit expectations, they get replaced by somebody who is less focused on the next 10 years or the next 20 years, more focused on the next quarter, but turns the startup into uh, some uh, more conventional adjunct of big pharma. I would say that at least in my realm of awareness, the answer is not yet. That the that there that uh, the pioneers are not yet being muscled out because it's way too early to muscle them out. The VC typically don't even know what it means. What does longevity mean in terms of where the rubber meets the road? So it's it's uh, it's still early. Second, uh, VC is a vehicle. Um, they have a fiduciary responsibility to return uh, profits. It's not a secret what they're there for. So, you know, that's their job. They're supposed to get 10, 20 X returns on their money. Our, the difference between us and the typical VC, although there are VCs that are like this, the difference between us and them is we work hard. Our team works hard to make every company we invest in a success because we care about the mission. Whereas uh, the, the typical thought on a VC is they'll invest in 20 companies and they want two unicorns and a few of them will fail and some of them will, will be, you know, eh, that was okay. No, we, we, 
we give attention to all of our companies to make them succeed because death is the result if they don't succeed. Um, so there's a difference. And we also don't have a fiduciary responsibility. We have a mission responsibility. That's why at the beginning we chose 501c3. So we wouldn't get confused. It's really hard when you have goals in conflict. And we don't. Yes. That is good to hear. Now, in terms of the attributes of the companies that you invest in that are conducive to the success and longevity of those companies, what would you say those attributes are? And what do you think it is important to do in order to cultivate them? Um, you've met one scientist, you've met one scientist. So the answer is you get to know each other. Everyone has things they don't know. Uh, there's lots that I don't know. And so we try to identify the gaps and find fine human beings to fill those gaps. Um, you know, that's, that's not a, a pat answer. It's not a simple answer, but really it varies with each entrepreneur. Some are pure scientists and they don't want to leave academia. Okay, well, how do we organize around that? Some of them can't wait to leave academia and start their own thing. Um, and they won't listen to you. So how do you deal with that? So it, it, it's across the map. So you, you have to have an organization that has a lot of people skills um so no we don't have a formula for that humans are varied we have varied responses so it's more about understanding each situation on its own terms and figuring out the best way to yeah. encourage positive growth that's it so in some cases um they need someone to focus them on getting a result scientifically which is a proof of concept for others, they need to understand that they're going to be needing $10 million within the next 18 months, and you're not able to do that. It's not your fault, but you need to, you, you still need it. So we need to help you find people who can help you do that. And it might cost you some stock, some equity, uh, and we'll help you find them. Yes, thank you for those answers. And now Jason asks, how could AI best help in longevity research? Do you have any ideas in this regard? In, uh, on September 11th, 2001, I sent a letter to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation saying, what we ought to do is to create an artificially intelligent human digital model, a digital human. Um, I never got an answer to that letter. <laughs> but I still believe that at some point, we will be able to go from analog human tissue to uh, in silico models. I don't think it will happen anytime real soon. The reason I think I, we won't get there soon is because we still have no idea of the depth of complexity of the human organism, or really any mammal, but especially the human organism. We live three times longer than we ought to, and we don't know why, as far as I know. Like, that's a pretty fundamental issue. We don't know why we live three times longer. So, so no, I don't think AI is going to be a replacement. I think the question though was help in longevity research. I, I do think that uh, big data um, uh, is going to be extremely important in being able to take real time results from the patient trials and the chip constructs so that they can be interpreted in near real time. So one can imagine 
that a, uh, a chip would be sent on a mission to Mars instead of an astronaut. And you discover in real time that this astronaut would be microwaved within the first 90 days. So we probably shouldn't send this particular astronaut. Well, that's going to take enormous data collection and interpretation and analysis. So I think that's where I wouldn't call it AI. I would call it big data. I, I'm not sure I understand what AI actually means. Uh, there's uh, Eliezer Yudkowsky and Ben Goertzel. Those gentlemen have a sense of what they're talking about when it comes to AI. Well, are there any big questions that like a super intelligent AI could answer for you? Like what is aging itself? Is wonder if I, I we already make... know the answer we already know the oh, we answer. do <laughs> okay. it's, yeah, it's, it's 42 42 <laughs> 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 oh, okay <laughs> you're a funny guy man <laughs> so uh we can only go on what we know it may be that in 2024 an ai will discover the answer and all the stuff that we at Methuselah and uh, other researchers are doing will be found to be obsolete. Goody. I would love for that to happen. Do I think it's gonna happen? No. Do I have any experience in figuring out how to be useful in that? No. Do I believe it, honestly? No, I don't believe it. Um, I, my belief is based on um, empirical input. Empirically, uh, I know that we don't know what we don't know about our own biology. Nobody has, okay, let's say, but let's put it this way. I literally do not know where the words I'm speaking are coming from. I have no idea. Nobody else knows either. Why isn't it just a stream of screeching gibberish Although some of you may feel that way. <laughs> um, why is it? We just don't know. I mean, something as normal as that. I don't even think about breathing, but oh my God, I'd notice it if I stopped in three minutes. But we all just keep breathing and we think we know the answers to all this. I, humility is a key component for getting this thing solved. One of my favorite things is uh, phytoplankton. Phytoplankton don't know there's a sun. And yet, in the ocean, if the sun is shining too brightly, collectively, the phytoplankton will begin eluting particles that float up the water column, go into the atmosphere, and seed clouds. And those clouds, what do they do? They act as umbrellas. <laughs> That's insane. It's yeah, true. Yeah, I didn't it's know that. Wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. And it was only this a decade ago that anybody noticed. I'll give you another example. I have a dog. The dog will go for a walk in November, December, and January. And I hated walking the dog. You'd walk the dog, and the dog would like, want to stand in the snow and sniff around and I'm freezing to death. Come on, do it. Then the dog would finally pick the perfect spot to poop. Like, this is important. Okay, just let's get on with it. So then um, after pooping, it would do a victory dance, pawing the ground. And then we would go home I'd be hating my life and the dog was prancing like it had done the most important thing ever. Stupid dog. Well, then spring came around and I was walking by her normal you know, pooping grounds. They, they have habits. And I noticed that there were these little circles about 10 inch wide of growth while the rest of the growth was you know low cover that after the winter was maybe three quarters of an inch tall these 10 inch medallions 
were already a foot and a half high. And that they were evenly spaced one from another so that with time they would grow and grow together. My dog was a capitalist and the poop was the concentration of the capital which would eventually become a forest. It was not random at all. I've never read anything in the literature. The only reason I discovered it is because I was pissed at my dog, but was watching. And now, one more thing. If you notice the 17-year cicada, isn't it wonderful that it's a 17-year prime number kind of thing? Have you noticed the branches on the oak trees that on all of the oak trees and maybe some other species, I'm, I'm, I don't only know about the oak, um, that the extreme limbs have been dying and have been cut and are about to fall. And that takes the cicada eggs to the ground where they can do their thing 17 years from now. And at the same time, you'll note that all of the oak trees every 17 years get a haircut, a perfectly symmetrical pruning haircut. You have to live a long time to see these patterns and you have to not be sticking your head in a computer screen all day long and missing the actual world, how wonderful it is. So AI, wouldn't it be wonderful if we just had I? <laughs> wouldn't it be wonderful if Homo sapien actually was wise? So that kind of brings us back around to what is Methuselah up to? I'd like us to live long enough to become wise, decent, good, have the joy of discovery, and to share it. That's what I'm up to. Yes, and if we have more time, at least the probability of gaining that kind of wisdom increases, and we would have more time also to observe the external world. Uh, I think we would feel less pressure to kind of be channeled into common undertakings and life paths that a lot of people pursue because there's a sense of urgency that they're running out of time. They have to do this now or else. And indeed exploring the world, uh, trying to figure out new truths about it, previously undiscovered truths, is an activity that requires some leisure, some flexibility, because you never know what you're going to discover and when. So yes, thank you for those insights. Now I would like to go around the panel and ask our panel members if they have any questions or comments for you. Let's start with Art Ramon Garcia. Uh, yeah, how do you feel about a business venture that would focus on uh, animal age extinction, uh, specifically like with milking cows and chickens and that would help the industry, you know, save money with not having so much turnover and possibly that in doing that research, there could be some sort of new uh, breakthrough that could apply to humans. Uh, I'm in favor of, uh, re of improving the lives of animals. Um, and it seems to me that um, what you said is a, is a good, good thing to, to pursue. It's not a focus of the foundation, but I think it's a, it's a very good thing. It's a product I would like to buy for my 13 year old, 13 year old Shiba Inu. She is a lovely creature. Um, now that I understand her winter habits <laughs> and I'd love for her to not be slowing down, but I can see her slowing down and, and I don't, I, like to be able to buy something to stop it. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. And now let us go to Ben Balweg. 
Hi, David. Thanks for being here today. Uh, as I was preparing, I was looking at uh, what Methuselah is uh, most involved in, and it surprised me how much was in the uh, bioprinting sphere. Uh, I wondered if you knew of any other organization that covers the breadth of bioprinting that Methuselah W firm, uh, Wake Forest University is very deeply involved. Um, and we're actually partnered with Anthony Atala on the uh, human chip on a road, uh, uh, human, you know, patient trials on the chip. Um, and their, their teams also won the vascular tissue challenge. So I would say that in the academic space, they're preeminent. Uh, as far as a foundation, um, maybe there are, but none, none comes to mind. I think that SENS may have wanted to, but hasn't yet done anything in this area. Um, to be fair, SENS and Methuselah tend to stay in their own areas so that we don't, you know, Waste, each, waste our investments or our, our focus so that uh, we make the greatest uh, impact with our activities. So for instance, while uh, SENS has been uh, fundraising for a long time, we've stayed out of their way. We wanted them to get the money because their uh, programs tended to be uh, you know, 15 years out and ours were focused at five to uh, 10 years out. So, so Ben, I don't, I don't know of any others that uh, would have taken the risk on Organovo, Viscient, uh, Volumetric and so forth. Uh, there's a, a few venture capitalists who have taken that leap. And a lot of our, our donors and uh, investors have gone alongside with us on these investments, not just us. Uh, we, we'd be nothing without them. So no, I don't know of any other uh, group that's, that's focused like we have on that. Well, congratulations and applause to you then for hitting a real useful, hopefully niche for this. Thank you. And it, once again, it came from a, a, a woman, a friend of our family who lost both kidneys. Uh, sympathy is a powerful thing. I looked at that and I realized not only did she lose her kidneys, but she's lost her life. She's spending four hours, four days a week having to, to get cleaned out in dialysis. And that's like $6 billion a year that taxpayers are paying for. The whole thing is a mess. And wouldn't it be good to have new parts for people? Carol Shelby, the inventor or the, the developer of the AC Cobra, 427 Cobra, my, my early dream car. You can build one of those from scratch. Lots of people do. It's a brand new, but try and get Carol Shelby new parts. He got a kidney transplant and he got a heart transplant. They were all junkyard parts. It did help him stay alive longer, but that's stupid. That's got to change. So sympathy, empathy is, um, you know, kind of a guiding light for us. Oh, by the way, she got a kidney. So life is good there. Yes, it's good to hear some good news in that regard. Hopefully we will encounter more patient success stories as regenerative medicine advances, as we have more replacement organs that are biocompatible with the patients who receive them, uh, I think that would be a tremendous improvement to many people's qualities of life. So now let's go to David Shoemaker. Yes, hi, David. Uh, I'm very grateful for the approach and the work of the uh, Methuselah Foundation. I don't really have a question, but I've been fascinated by the topic today. And uh, by the way, in uh, 2030, I'll be age 80. And I'm really looking forward to the functionality that I had back at age 50. And I too remember that quite well. So thank you very much. 
thank you for your con uh, comment. I hope we're there for you. I'm planning on it. Thank you. Yes, I think David Shoemaker would be an excellent proof of concept if we can get him rejuvenated to uh, be biologically age 50. Uh, I can't think of a, a better outcome for humanity uh, than to see that kind of scenario. So uh, I definitely hope to see it in nine years. Now let's go to Edward Hudgens. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm only a few uh, years behind David uh, Shoemaker, so you know I'll volunteer as well. By the way, there is, I think, an artificial kidney using nanotech material. I think that's in trials right now. So that could be something uh, that gives us a little bit of optimism in the future, because I, I too have known a lot of folks who've had to go through some dialysis. But I just want to say, I mean, you know, I've been familiar with your organization for quite some time. Incredible, excellent work, incredible, excellent discussion. And my project is to bring this sort of promise of exponential technology, not only in this area, but in other areas uh, for commercial use, um, out of our wonderful little salons here and out of the SENS community and out of uh, Peter Diamandis's abundance community and singularity and so forth and get it out to basically framework our thinking in the culture. So, I mean, that's been, that's my mission. And so I'm very happy to see what you've done with uh, Dylan Livingston and his group. And I'm gonna be working uh, with them. I'm a C3 too, by the way. And so I'm hoping to be able to engage with you and be a mouthpiece or a mind piece <laughs> here among influencers in the future. Just keep up the darn good work. Thank you very much, Edward. We will try our best. Right, excellent. Now let's go to Alexandria Black. So good to meet you, David, and look forward to uh, seeing how we might work with you. Um, I also want to be one of those longevity poster children, rejuvenated. Uh, but um, something, I had some ideas. Um, what if we could? Um, print new parts to the brain, for example, uh, give uh, the right hemisphere speech ability, rather than always uh, leave the left brain fumbling to explain it. I think that would help. And also, if we could have better connectivity between the amygdala and the frontal cortex, so we weren't always so triggered. Uh, any thoughts on how we might achieve um, something better with neuroplasticity and, and uh, 3D printing so we could have that extra speech center added over here. So good to meet you. Yeah, so I don't know that uh, I can speak to uh, uh, changing the architecture or the functionality of the architecture. But what I can say is that uh, you will probably be seeing um, an announcement in the next 90 days related to um, brain tissue rejuvenation. And I just uh, invite you to stay tuned. So as a secondary comment, I am interested in optimizing what we are. I am very worried about fundamentally changing what we are. And until we really know what we are, I think it's a bad idea to change it. Think about how many people love their tattoos and then gradually they think, you know, I don't want this tattoo. Before things change irreversibly, I'd like to at least know how we work optimally today. And I think we won't really have a, a good enough view on that for at least another 30 years. Yes, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of transhumanists have different points of view on this, but uh, you are actually more aligned with my view. I'm very hesitant myself to make uh, changes which may have 
impacts that could be, for instance, deleterious to the preservation of the individual's identity and continuity of self. Some other transhumanists might not have a problem with, say, a destructive mind upload, but I certainly would. I think there needs to be a preservation of the biological organism to the extent possible. And if there are artificial components, especially to the mind, there needs to be a process continuity and uh, at the very least uh, a good understanding of how uh, analogous artificial components can replicate human consciousness. And we're not there yet uh, in terms of our advances. So to me, biological rejuvenation seems to be uh, the most promising way to go in the near term future. And of course, the other research paths should be pursued as well. But we need to be careful for the sake of preserving our individual selves. Now, Alexandria, did you want to follow up on this? Yes, when dad stroked out three years ago, he could understand us, but he couldn't speak. What if something like that were trialed in uh, stroke patients so they could speak again? Um, I would recommend that you look at the work of Shai Efrati, S-H-A-I, E-F-R-A-T-I, Shai Efrati. He's in a, a researcher in Israel who has had extremely impressive results using hyperbaric oxygen therapy for deep stroke victims and recovering after significant amounts of time, even years, the recovery of ischemic stroke victims. Shai Efrati, I have no investments in him. Further, okay. what I would say, further what I would say is there is emerging uh, tantalizing research, clinical research, that has shown that your brain will sometimes enter an anaerobic state. It can, on its own, block off certain memory areas and put those memory areas in suspended animation such that you cannot remember things such as having been raped as a child. It's simply not accessible because after hyperbaric oxygen therapy, there are anecdotal clinical uh, uh, accounts in the literature, you can find them, that show that after like, I think it was 19 sessions of two atmospheres, HBOT, uh, I think eight weeks, that about after the 19th session, people started remembering very disturbing things. And then they checked with the perpetrator and it actually happened. Those areas of the brain had blocked themselves off in order to preserve the person. We, once again, we are vastly more complicated than we can even imagine. And so I don't want to mess around with that, nor do I want to give other powers the ability. Once you give a tool to, once a tool comes into existence, it will be used. And so I would rather not have neural lace if I can forestall that. I'd rather have these advances come first. And this is interesting. Most likely these advances will be developed in parallel, but of course how they will be applied is an open question. I think most people would not be comfortable in drilling holes in their skull for uh, a brain enhancement, but if some sort of non-invasive technology could be developed that mimics uh, or applies the kinds of effects that Neuralink has today, probably a lot of people would be willing to try it, but then it would be removable. So perhaps then the effect could be mitigated. I think where we should be careful is making permanent alterations, especially to the brain, without understanding what the effects would be. Yeah, so we don't know how complicated the brain is. Yeah, right. We just don't know. 
So I begged for hyperbaric <laughs> oxygen for mom. It was not in the treatment plan. Uh, I begged therapies for dad. I, I couldn't get them right to try for anything, and it wasn't covered by any insurance. So that's where we are. Yeah. So how can we make these treatments more available to people, especially right now? There are some experimental treatments that you've mentioned that have shown benefits in certain studies, but uh, medical bureaucracies, uh, especially payment bureaucracies, they tend to be uh, stuck in certain paradigms, very reluctant to uh, give people the option to try experimental treatments that may or may not work, but they could be the only thing that's available for a given patient. Otherwise, the outcomes are deeply suboptimal, uh, to say the least. Well, that's a fair question, but maybe I'm not the right fellow to ask. Um, the insurance industry is not something that I've uh, decided to, to that was in my remit to, to tackle. Um, I recognize that costs are high. I recognize that there's um, a lot that needs to be done on this um, in this field, but you know, we have to stay on our our path. Um, there are some things that capitalism are, is good at, and there are some things that it stinks at. So, this is just one of those things where it stinks. Yes. For any any uh, any um, any approach that's starts with a machine that's going to cost $20,000 and then it's going to cost a $150,000 technician fully loaded um, and then a floor that needs to be able to handle the weight of a hyperbaric oxygen chamber plus the scheduling thereof. It's nobody's fault. It's what it costs. And it, as soon as somebody can convince Medicare and Medicaid that it's a valid um, use of a technology, that it's medically relevant and successful, and that it will reduce overall costs, then, then there's an argument. It's not an argument I'm going to make. But there's lots of foundations that could and perhaps should help make that argument. Yes, well, I hope we get to see the reduction of the costs of some of these treatments in the coming decade in order to achieve the objectives that you have in mind, because I think if the costs come down, as they've come down with various other consumer technologies, for instance, it's just that medicine seems to be an exception recently for whatever reason, but if the costs do come down, then there will be a lot more public interest in innovative treatments and payers are also going to be more inclined to support them because they have less to lose. Literally so, less to yes, lose. Absolutely. Figure so out how to make them money. That's, <laughs> that's basically it. How do you make them money? How do you save them money? Mm -hmm. They're gonna be responsive to that, you would hope. <laughs> Yes, if they are rational, which doesn't always happen, but yes, one would hope. Now, let us go to Jason Geringer. Jason, uh, any questions or comments for David? Um, yeah, I'm curious as to what your opinion is about gamification in research for, uh, like you had that mouse prize project. I'm wondering how complicated was that? Could just like anybody do that? You know, I know there's a, we had a, a guest on the salon, Kent Kamish, that has this, uh, it's called a demon poor console that runs these little biological experiments and he's gamifying it. And I'm wondering if there could be a gamification of this uh, mouse prize idea. Cause I mean, I know I'd probably pay a hundred bucks to get a kit and raise a mouse and see how long, you know, if it's got a, this plan that might make it live long. Yeah, that would be fun. You know, uh, just wondering how, what you think about all that, if that's a possible thing. 
maybe or not. <laughs> it's it's intriguing, but a little too hypothetical. So I'm going to say I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I will say though that uh, I know Kent, and uh, we've made some modest investments to see what might happen with uh, Kent's work. Awesome. Well, hopefully he'll. I can buy miles from him one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yes, uh, we all wish Kent Kamish great success in his initiative. Uh, and Demon Poor, uh, by the way, recently changed its name to Molecular Reality. Uh, I'm going to. Oh, really? Post, yes, in the oh. YouTube chat. Uh, the WeFunder link for that initiative. Uh, they mm -hmm. are, I think, quite far along in raising funds for the molecular gaming console. The gaming console is still going to be called the Demon 464. It's just the company oh. is now called Molecular Reality. Uh, they've raised over $150,000 now, so congratulations to them. Now, uh, I also am interested in learning more about the cryptocurrency donation that was recently made uh, to the Methuselah Foundation. And this was mentioned in our internal chat several times. Skip Siddiqui points out that Methuselah Fund received over 40% of the total stock of the dog Elon Musk coin from the Ethereum founder Vitalik Buterin and uh, this was an interesting move uh, so dog Elon Musk is uh, ob obviously uh, intended to uh, have a parallel to Dogecoin uh, hence the name but uh, they are interested in incentivizing the colonization of Mars. Uh, that was one of the purposes for which uh, that cryptocurrency was created. So what happened with the Methuselah Foundation receiving this huge stock of uh, this cryptocurrency and what are you planning to do with it? So we, uh, it's called uh, Dogalan Mars, not Musk, Mars. Um, the Ether symbol is E L O N, Elon. Just, just uh, getting the facts on the ground. Um, it's forty-three point two percent of the entire circulation. Um, the market cap is probably today in the sixty sixty-five million dollar range. <clears throat> we view that community as an opportunity to socialize them on the idea of extended longevity as a necessary component of getting to Mars. When the donation happened, the community had no idea who we were. And the developers had no idea who we were. So this was a shotgun marriage. We didn't know who they were. <laughs> so Anyway, the, where it is today is we are a friend of the token and we are uh, educating the community because that's part of our uh, charter is to educate uh, on uh, longevity and health, extending the human lifespan. And also since we are working with NASA on uh, um, vascular tissue challenge and the deep space food challenge, it's just wonderful kismet um, you know, I, I believe that there are higher powers and I believe they have a sense of humor <laughs> and that here we are. Yeah, so, I love all your metaphors, man. <laughs> <They're> great. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so we, uh, we have, um, informed the community that our, uh, our intentions were peaceful, <laughs> <laughs> we come in peace and we're not going to blow the whole thing just by trying to sell all in one night. In fact, our plan is, and we, uh, we vowed 
that we would not sell for at least one year. I can only tell you my current feelings. This is not a plan. This is my feelings. I would like to never sell it and maybe make some uh, gains from um, staking it or loaning it out or, or hypothecating it in some way that's gainful, but non-fattening, non-threatening, and not evil. Uh, and to assist the community to grow and to gradually bend toward understanding that if you're dead, you can't go to Mars. If you prematurely age, you're not gonna like it there. And by the way, Earth is a pretty good place. Let's make it pretty good too. And the Deep Space Food Challenge assists in that uh, rhetoric. And they, they love us. Well, by they, I mean the people who bothered to speak about it. You know, maybe out of 100 people, two people will comment. And lots of them are, let's be, let's be honest, they're in it because they want to get a quick Lamborghini and will probably fail. <laughs> Yes, I, I think anyone who wants to get a quick Lamborghini is missing the point. Uh, I think both of cryptocurrencies and the endeavor to colonize Mars or the endeavor to achieve life extension, all of those are longer term projects. They require a longer term vision and staying in the game for a long period of time. But it is quite reassuring uh, i would expect to people in the cryptocurrency community to have an entity like the methuselah foundation holding such a large stock of dog elon mars because that means this will not be a pump and dump type of situation this will be uh, a cryptocurrency that can be stabler in its value it's less likely to be used as a speculative instrument yeah, we, our, our, our time horizons, you know, nine years. And what you didn't mention was the $4 million worth of ether that he donated to us. So we are organized, I mentioned a 50 caliber bullet. We are organized to be hyper efficient and effective. That, that may sound uh, immodest. All I'm saying is that's how we're organized. and. Uh, so $4 million is plenty for us to achieve what we need to achieve, at least for the next, you know, five years or so. And if you think about it from a uh, escape velocity standpoint, you know, when you light the engine, you have set your destiny. You, have, you can make a modest course corrections, but there's not much you can do once the thing is, is going where it's going. So we use a, a, a model that's like that. We started uh, Lucadia, we started Turn, we started Oshin, they're launched. We don't operate their control room. They are autonomous entities. So, so we don't need to, to sell it. We don't want to sell it. What we want to do is to make the current community, which is around 72,000 holders, we'd like by the end of the year for it to be 100,000. I don't know if we'll get there, but it would be nice. And then in another year, it'd be nice to be at half a million. You see what I'm getting at? So that maybe, and that now you have an audience. You've been talking about how hard it is to get an audience that we're all trading coconuts on a desert island. <laughs> we need to get off that island and this is a way to do it now think about how expensive it would be to talk to an audience of seventy thousand people if you were to have to buy ads to find a very targeted narrow audience that'd be really expensive on a continuous basis but since this is a token where they have their own opportunity for upside they can't wait to hear more from us like and what did it cost us nothing we just have we just have to have the clue to know what we have i think about uh, the person the first person who found a diamond what is it 
it's kind of a glassy looking potato nothing. And they walk right on by. Well, we, we, we found it, that we had a diamond thrown at us without asking for it. And instead of selling it and destroying all of those folks whose hopes were that this thing would grow, that's, that's what made our decision. I can't do that. I won't do that. And none of our team wanted to do it either. They were all, we were all unanimous. No, we can't do that. So we didn't. And as a result, we've got this community that's growing. And uh, anyway, that's the story on Dogel on Mars. Excellent. Well, we look forward to some growth in that and uh, definitely some engagement from that community. Hopefully, we'll be able to get many more supporters for rejuvenation biotechnology and the effort to reach longevity escape velocity as a result. Now, there's another news item that I would be interested in your comments on because multiple viewers have pointed it out since the salon started. There was an announcement very recently, just a few days ago, about the formation of Altos Labs, a collaboration between Jeff Bezos and Yuri Milner. And Aubrey had kind of been hinting that this was going to happen uh, over the course of a few months. He was saying at our virtual enlightenment salon that essentially there's going to be an announcement made sometime later this year about an individual whose name everyone knows who is going to start becoming seriously involved in the longevity field. And he said it a bit less politely than I'm going to say it, uh, but his message to this individual is, don't mess it up the way that uh, the Google founders did when they launched Calico. So what do you see as the potential uh, for this kind of venture, as well as the possible pitfalls? What would it need to do to avoid becoming like Calico, at least in Aubrey's mind, Calico has not had uh, that much to show for itself despite eight years of existence and a huge budget. So how can this venture potentially be different and make the kind of difference in the aging research field that we would want to see in terms of tangible progress? I would say that uh, the principal, Richard Klausner, is a very savvy individual. Um, so that's a good thing. I would further say that the idea of million dollar salaries uh, for um, scientists, um, if that were to spread around a lot, it would remove uh, scientists from their current positions, which would likely end their work, what they're working on today. That is a net loss. Then you have the time it takes for them to come up to speed in a brand new organization, which usually brand new organizations do not know what they are. Without a culture, there is no real organization. So you know, one of the things that will also have to happen is there needs to be a language thesaurus built. What does marker mean to you? What does, does pathway mean the same thing to you as it does to me? So I, do, I haven't seen their plan, but I have seen a lot of companies and I've seen a lot of companies that have the best names in the business. And I'll just go right back to reality. Reality doesn't care what your name is. Reality doesn't care how much money you've got. Reality only yields its secrets when you're right. That's it. So what does money do? It gives you the opportunity to improve your shots on goal. And if you're clever to attract, hopefully, the people who can, you know, aim correctly.
So what do I think? I think that um, other companies mentioned in the MIT Tech Review article, such as uh, Turn and David Sinclair are doing excellent work in this field and have been doing it for a long time. And that that was no doubt not lost on the folks at Altos and that's why they're involved because they see it as an extremely pragmatically valuable path to achieve what we're trying to achieve. All that does is makes companies like Turn vastly more valuable and investable. So on that basis, I'm glad they're there. Um, but we won't know for at least three years, you know, what, what real effect that they might have. Anything else? Nope, I got nothing. <laughs> well, thank you for that insight. And indeed, it seems like a venture of that scale is going to need some time to take off and coordinate its efforts internally. Uh, hopefully, it will amount to something within a few years. And hopefully, the entrance of this caliber of investment is going to spur on other investment. It's going to motivate other individuals of means to look at the longevity field and say, hmm, Jeff Bezos is investing in it. Yuri Milner is investing in it. Perhaps there are gains to be made. And they're going to look at also the existing companies and the value propositions that they offer. So thinking of it in terms of physics, um, I think in terms of what I call psychophysics. So we're, we are a collective field. Uh, and uh, collective consciousness, but it's a field, and a field can collapse, right? So what is what this is do is what the Altos thing is likely to do is to collapse the field and to focus investment into the area that Altos has now um, featured. So I would expect that epigenetic reprogramming will become a big story for the next little while mRNA has become a big story. Turn happens to use mRNA to do its epigenetic reprogramming. So we're seeing a collapsing of the field, which leads to a spark. And so what you said may come true. And that is that will, it will focus um, attention on longevity. I hope that happens. As do we all. Now, this is a question that I think is on many people's minds, especially if they're supporters of life extension research and advocacy already. Oracle 86 asks, how can we help make this vision happen nine years from now? And if somebody is a person of ordinary means, perhaps not a scientist, uh, but may have some other skill set, what would you say lay persons can do at this stage to assist in efforts like those of the Methuselah Foundation? Obviously, they can donate. Uh, what else can they do? So we keep a volunteer, this is the Methuselah Foundation, we keep uh, some volunteer positions that were interested in, in filling, so you can volunteer. Um, we're, I am personally very interested in finding someone or some ones who are competent at developing for blockchain, especially Ethereum. Okay, that's very specific, but uh, that's something we'd like to have. Uh, <clears throat> other things. Well, Skip made friends with me. He made a little... Uh, little video for Dogalon and said, hey, would you come on this program? And I said, yes, right? So that's one thing you can do is to socialize the idea 
at uh, cocktail parties and Zoom sessions. Um, what else can you do? If you find a hole, you can decide to start to fill it yourself, not depend on other people, and give it a shot. There are two things people are terrified of, failure and being seen to be a failure. So if you can get over that fear, then you can start your own foundation if you find a hole that needs to be filled. Nobody says you can't. Nobody told me I couldn't. I looked in the mirror and said, I'll, I'm going to do this. And so I did. I had no money to apply to it. A very wise man once said to me, a um, fellow one day says he wants to be a plumber. So he could have gone to an apprentice apprenticeship and spent you know 15 years becoming a master plumber or he could buy the tools put the belt on and start reading up on it and then uh, go out and see if anybody needed a plumber and start plumbing and then one day you're you're just a plumber so far you don't need a license to become a non-profit <laughs> longevity centered um, uh, foundation we have fiscally sponsored Organ Preservation Alliance, Super Centenary and Research Foundation, SENS Foundation. Um, now we're, we're helping uh, A4LI. Uh, so I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but yeah. Start your own foundation, find a hole, fill it. Those are some excellent suggestions and hopefully those listening to the live stream now or those who will revisit the recording in the months and years to come will find some inspiration in these ideas and apply themselves in whatever ways they consider most fruitful to benefit this movement. So now we come to the point in our conversation where I would like to give you as our guest the last word in terms of any insights, ideas, or uh, concluding remarks that you would have. How would you want to sum up this conversation or is there anything else that you would like to mention that we haven't covered uh, or haven't covered in sufficient depth? Uh, how would you like to bring this to a close? Well, okay. Uh, one day I, uh, so I worked at uh, the Department of Homeland Security, Transportation Security Administration while I was uh, uh, working on the foundation. And uh, my job <laughs> was to be Dr. Evil. My job, among many other things, was to anticipate what terrorists might be planning. In fact, to do their planning. And by anticipating what they could do, to preempt their ability to achieve it by eliminating the ability to affect a target. For instance, if you want to disrupt a major city with tunnels, blow the tunnels. Okay, how would you blow a tunnel? Maybe you'd go in the maintenance and access tunnel, which is right next to it. Oh, nobody's watching the entrance for those things. Ah, let's put gates there and make sure that they can't get through. So that was done. So that's what I did among, and so there were, a lot. I can't, it's a lot of it is still secret. However, one day I asked myself, what's the opposite of terrorist? Is there a word in English for the opposite of terrorist? I asked myself these ridiculous questions from time to time. Like, why would you even ask that? But anyway, I did. I asked myself. And it turns out that I couldn't find a word for it. What would be the opposite of a terrorist? It would be someone who wasn't particularly interested in becoming well-known. 
for obvious reasons, and that would do good things to give people joy, the opposite of terror, joy, an anticipation that things are gonna be fine, in fact, better. And they would do it for their own reasons, not, not for pay. And so I said, well, what would, be, what would a word be for that? And I, my answer was euphorist. It took me a while to get there. Euphoria, one whose goal is to induce a feeling of joy, goodness, peace, and to just make that happen. So if you, if you like the idea, you could give it some coinage, give it some currency, be a euphorist. In a way, I think that's what you want to be. You want to be that for yourself. You want longevity for yourself, but you also want it for your family. And you also want it to be available to anybody. And then to take actions to do that, to see that it happened, well, that's what a euphorist is, the opposite of a terrorist. So that's how I will end. Thank you very much to David Goebel for joining us today in a fascinating virtual enlightenment salon. We have learned a lot about the work of the Methuselah Foundation and a lot about you as an individual and your many remarkable skill sets and insights. This is the kind of conversation that we always enjoy having and we look forward to having many more such discussions in the future. To our audience, thank you for joining us to our panel. Thank you for the excellent questions and insights. And now I wish you all good day and live long and prosper. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> really enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Of course. And, uh, I'm going to say adios, live long and prosper. Awesome. You're a really cool guy, man. I'm glad you, oh. I'm glad you came here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. All right. Recording Bye, stopped.